بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته How is everyone? الحمد لله You know this talk tonight initially when I spoke to Sheikh Asif was this was um, last month uh, at his home he asked me to come and do this talk yeah about spiritual wellness uh, because apart from my full-time occupation I work in the charity sector I've also been traveling the world for the past uh, 18 years giving da'wah giving lectures um, I am also a life coach and a counselor and that's what I do in, in my mornings that's what I did full-time during the pandemic and now I do it in the mornings before I head to the office and over the past three years we've counseled and, and, and coached over 1300 Muslims with all types of, of, of mental disorders as well as spiritual disorders which seems to be the, the, the rampant issue of the day. So he wanted this talk to be on spiritual wellness but I would be amiss and I started kind of revising this uh, last weekend um, with what is happening in Philistine and, and in Gaza with our brothers and sisters. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, aid them and accept them and, and grant them from amongst their dead to be the inhabitants of paradise and, and, and give them help and assistance insha'Allah ta'ala. We've seen this over and over again, you know, with, with our brothers and sisters, but this one, this one seems to be a little bit different. I don't know if any of you noticed what I'm noticing, but this one's a little bit different. I actually was in Lebanon on Saturday and Sunday when, when a lot of this stuff started happening. We were in the refugee camps for the Syrians and the Palestinians um, in, in Lebanon. And um, it gives you a lot of perspective on, on things. So I kind of reworked this to have some, some aspects of how do we understand these types of things that go on in our life. Because one of the number one I don't want to say complaints, but one of the number one issues people have come to me with in terms of counseling and coaching, and even before that, when it, in, in the field of da'wah, is why is Allah putting me into such difficulty? This is like one of the number one questions I get. Why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala putting me into such difficulty? And I had to ask myself this question. This was a question that I explored during the pandemic. For those of you who don't know who I am, I accepted Islam in 1998. Um, I, I, I released a lot about my life on YouTube during the pandemic. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, I'm not going to waste your time with that tonight. Just go to youtube.com slash Evans and look up the domestic violence tapes and the prison tapes. Um, I, was, I, I was tortured in my childhood by my stepmother. I, I literally tortured by her for, for 10 years of my life and my upbringing. After that, I went through a lot of difficulties in, in coming to Islam. And then after that, I would end up spending some time in prison due to beating up a young man at a payphone, which is part of my how I came to Islam story, how the Bible led me to Islam. Uh, in prison, I was stabbed by another Muslim who thought that I should not be the Imam because I was white. He missed my heart by three millimeters. Um, so, you know, it, it's one thing and after becoming a Muslim, it's been one struggle after another. And if you are not struggling as a Muslim, which we'll get to, if you don't find struggles as a Muslim, then see that as a problematic part of your faith. See that as, as, as a scary issue. So, there are three points I want to discuss tonight. And they're based on what I remember a young man telling me about 10 years ago. I met a young man, a teenage boy who came out of Homs, Syria. This was during the, the, the height uh, of the Syrian war when, when the entire neighborhoods and entire cities were just being eradicated. And there was a young man who made it out of Homs, which was one of the most hard hit places, right? He had gone through the refugee camps, he had come here to America, and he was telling his story. And I remember talking to him and saying to him that, you know, the, 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 the Muslim Ummah feels for the struggles of, of, of the people of, of Syria. And we're trying to do our best to help you guys. And what he told me changed a lot of my perspective on things. He said, don't feel sorry for us. We feel sorry for you. And this reminds me of something that my wife was telling me on the way here, as a matter of fact, that there was a, a girl who had sent a WhatsApp, it's going around on WhatsApp now, she had sent a message out of Gaza. And this also reminds me of something that I heard from a woman in Mandera, Kenya. Don't feel sorry for us, we feel sorry for you. You guys here in the West are living lives of luxury. 
lives of luxury. You have, you know, your, your, your nice homes, most of you. Most of us, trust me, I just came from the refugee camps in, in, of the Syrians and Palestinians in, in Lebanon. All of us live in luxury compared to that. A park bench in Richardson is luxury compared to that. He said, you guys live in luxury with full refrigerators, heating, air conditioning. You know, you drive your cars to and from work and if you run out of food, there's a grocery store down the street, you can refill it again. He said, we worry about you. Allah has already put us to the test. And most of us have already died in that test. Our test is over. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already called us to account. He said, the people of my neighborhood before this whole catastrophe were people who were lost. They were people who were out partying and clubbing and doing all sorts of things. And then when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided to test us, people were standing in the streets making dua to Allah. They were going to the masajid even if the roofs were missing. People had come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this test was a means of barakah for them. What about your test? He said, luxury is your test. How are you going to stand in front of Allah on the day of judgment with all that He has granted you and the little that you've done? I didn't, I, what was I going to say? I was left without words. And for someone who speaks for a living, that's a hard task to accomplish. I was left without words. And this is very similar to this voice message that is coming from this young girl out of Gaza right now. Is that, don't make dua for us, we're making dua for you. We're making dua for you because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is already putting us through the difficulty. We're not going to have much to be questioned about because we haven't been given much. And what little we've been given has been taken away from us. But Allah has given you guys so much. The rest of the Muslim Ummah, especially in the West, has been given so much. There was a woman I met in Mandara, Kenya. Mandara is a desolate part of Kenya that borders with Somali and, Somali and Somaliland. And we were doing water wells in Mandara. And we had just gotten water to this village who had to walk three miles every single day one way. Three miles, three miles back to get water that wasn't even really fit for human consumption. And when the water came on and it started pouring out, you know, the people were jumping and they were happy. Everybody was happy, right? The kids are splashing in it. You think like this is a joyous occasion. There was an old lady who was crying and you could see that there was some displeasure on her face, right? So we went to her and we asked her, what's, what's wrong? And, and she said, and she spoke only, she spoke Swahili. She interpreted, the interpreter told her, she said, I am afraid this is going to be a punishment to Allah, from Allah to us. Before when we had to walk and get water, we thanked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for every single drop. We didn't waste a single bit of it. Now I see it pouring onto the ground and soaking into the earth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to ask us about every drop of this. So maybe this is more of a punishment than we think it is a blessing. This is the premise of how I rework this talk for today, insha'Allah. In three principles of spiritual wellness. Because you, you can go on social media right now and you can find a lot of people that will tell you about physical wellness, right? That's becoming like a fad. How to stay healthy, how to be in shape, how to live to be, you know, 150 years old and this and that and the other. Look, physical health is important. We as Muslims should be fit. It is part of the sunnah of the Prophet والسلام, to be fit. Even to the point where he said that there is no greater vessel, no worse vessel that can be filled except for your stomach. A third for food, a third for water, and a third for air. And, and even Umar ibn Khattab used to, he spoke about one man who had a big belly and he was talking about this, the barakah of Allah. He said this is the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So being fit is part of from, from the sunnah. But you'll have all these influencers online that tell you all these amazing plans, buy my plan, buy my subscription service, I'll tell you how to get healthy, I'll tell you how to get in shape. Before becoming a, a, a speaker who traveled around the world doing what I, what I did, I was a martial arts instructor. This is my, my, my Tajira background, is I ran martial arts academies in Florida. Successful ones, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. I have four black belts. Uh, um, I'm a certified Krav Maga instructor. Let me tell you the secret to staying healthy, and I'm not going to charge you for it. It's actually quite simple. There are three key elements to being physically fit. Number one, sleep. Sleep. Sleep properly every single night at the same time. Go to sleep on a regular schedule. I don't mean you need eight hours of sleep. You know, sleep for a few hours, get up. This was the sunnah of the Prophet والسلام, Pray, do something, go back to sleep, and then pray Fajr. But do it at the same time every single day. If your circadian rhythm is set, it is, is a key to, to physical health. Number two, eat real food. 
Eat real food. I'm, this is a freebie, by the way. This is not part of the lecture. It's a freebie. Eat real food. What do I mean by real food? If it did not grow from the ground or it did not have a heartbeat, it's not real food. Real food either grew from the ground, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created it, or it had a heartbeat before you ate it. This is real food. Everything we eat now is processed. Everything we eat now is filled with all kinds of artificial ingredients. This is killing us. It is, it is killing us. And cut down on sugar. Sugar is, 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 is like, uh, it, is, it is candy, but it is also candy to cancer. And number three, exercise. What kind of exercise? It doesn't matter. Just exercise. Go for a walk. Get your heart rate up. Do something. Move. When you stop moving, you start dying. And the older you get, the more you realize that. That when you stop moving, you start dying. So there you go. Sleep, eat real food, and just do some exercise. At least three times a week. You'll be healthy, inshaAllah ta'ala. But spiritual wellness, spiritual wellness is the key. It is the key. Because even if they create some sort of formula that allows the human being to live a thousand years, it does not save you from the inevitable. It does not save you from the promise of Allah that every soul shall taste death. And it does not save you from the inevitable questioning that comes after that death. It does not save you from standing in front of Allah on the day of judgment. It does not save you from akhirah in any way, shape, form or fashion. A person can live one million years and their body be in excellent shape. But if their spirit and their soul is corrupted and decayed, and away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then the length of life of that body and the health of that body won't help the soul. But in retrospect, if a person is sick, they live a short life, 20, 30 years, they have disease, they have things that go on and they, they, they die. It does not matter if their soul is right. If their soul is right, if the spirit, if the ruh is in the right place, then that soul will continue to live in perpetual bliss. In, in, the, in the gift of Jannah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the soul is more important, more important than the body. Even though the body is important to take care of because it's an amana, it's, it's a gift to us. And this is one of the first, one of the things, one of my first teachers told me that you, Sha'a, nothing belongs to you. He said, that's one thing I want you to learn about this life and learn about this world. The quicker you grasp this concept, the easier this world will be for you. Is that none of it belongs to you. Nothing in this world belongs to you, not even the body you're living in right now. It belongs to Allah. What do we say when someone dies? Inna lillahi wa inna alayhi raji'un. We belong to Allah, to Him we must return. He said, so even your body is an amana. He said, the only things that belong to you are the things that you give to Allah. Whatever you give to Allah belongs to you in akhirah. If you give your time for Allah, that time becomes a commodity on the Day of Judgment. If you give your money for the sake of Allah, that money becomes a commodity for you on the Day of Judgment. Anything you spend, fisibilillah, becomes commodity on the Day of Judgment. So none of it belongs to you. Spiritual wellness is so important that many of the ulama of the past have written volumes and volumes and volumes about it, which we don't have time for today. So I wanted to point out three key factors that not only talk about spiritual wellness, but also answer the question, why does Allah put me into such difficulty? First and foremost, let me ask you, how many of you have ever been put through difficulty? Raise your hands. I don't, I don't ask rhetoricals in my talks, by the way. You've ever been tested in your life? Raise your hand. No? You guys have all been amazing peach, peach lives. We've been tested, right? Been put into difficulties. Sometimes again and again and again. There might be some of you listening or somebody that watches the video that might be going through it right now. What are three things that I can focus on to get myself back to a point of spiritual wellness, but also answer the question, why does Allah put us into difficulty? First and foremost, the question of difficulty is a promise. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Ankabut, what? Ahasabun nasi. Does mankind think that they will be left alone? Does mankind think that I am going to leave them alone just because they say they believe? That just because you say, I believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I'm going to now leave you alone. That that gives you some golden ticket in this world. And I'm not going to test you. Surely I'm going to test you like I tested those who came before you. Why? So that I can show the truth of which one of you are truthful and which one of you are liars. About that statement, I believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the belief in Allah is shown in the time of tests. The Prophet sallallahu said that that iman, that faith, that test comes at the time of calamity. 
At the time, at the strike of a calamity is when you find out the, the real metal of your faith. The real metal of your faith. It's easy to be a believer when things are going well. It's easy to be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when He's given you everything on a silver platter. It's easy to do these things. But when the calamities strike, this is when the believer is put to the test and the metal is shown. So three things. Number one, perspective. Perspective is the key to spiritual wellness. It is the key to also answering the question, why does Allah put us into difficulty? Perspective, the way you view things. Because spiritual warfare, this is what we fight on a daily basis. You know, some of us, we do fight real enemies. There, 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 there are people out there that don't, that don't want to see you well. But even they are being poked and prodded by the unseen world by the shayateen and things of this nature, by shaitan and his minions. We fight spiritual warfare on a daily basis, on a daily basis. This is why the sunnah of the athkar in the morning and things of that nature are there. You know, the, the sunnah of, of eating seven ajwa dates in the morning to protect one from, from sihr and ayn. This is why the Prophet ﷺ spoke so much about the ayn and said it is real and it, it can harm you. It almost killed one companion of the Prophet ﷺ. We fight against things we can't see. So that mental, I mean, that spiritual warfare goes on right here, right here, right here. The make or break of the Muslim happens here. It happens and it begins right here. And I'm going to tell you why, even before we get to the heart, even for because these two are connected, they're interlinked, but there is a control mechanism. There's a control mechanism. All human, all human action has a predicate behind it. The Prophet Sallallahu and Imam Bukhari decided to make this first, his first hadith for a reason. Umar ibn al-Khattab said, the Prophet Sallallahu said, Every action is based upon its intention and everyone will get the reward of that which they intended. But even before that intention, all human action is predicated by what? Does anybody know? You cannot have a human action without this. It happens up here. A thought. A thought. No human action begins without thought. Actually, if you commit an action without thought, that is actually considered clinical insanity. Clinical insanity. You are not in control of your faculties. If you wanted to go to court, let's say you committed a crime, and you wanted to go to court and plead insanity, you have to prove that there was no thought. There was no forethought, there was no planning, that you were disconnected from your mental faculties of thought and that that action was completely irrational. That is clinical insanity. So every human being actions begin with a thought. Then that thought is formulated into an intention. And then that intention is either acted upon or it's not acted upon. And there is a, a, a system upon which you are rewarded for your intention actions. I'm not going to waste time with that because our time is very short. But all human thought, all human action begins with a thought. So your perspective is everything. The way you think will be the way you are. Will be the way you are. Our self-talk is the most important conversation that the human being will have. And it is even more so important for the Muslim. What is self-talk? Self-talk is the conversations you have with yourself up here. And don't think you don't have them. We all have them. We all talk to ourselves. If you don't talk to yourself, you are not a normal human being. We all talk to ourselves. Just most of us do it inaudibly in our heads. And this conversation that goes on up here that we have with ourselves sets the tone for the actions in our lives. It sets the tone for how we perceive ourselves. It sets the tone for how we perceive the people around us. It sets the tone for how we view the world around us. And more importantly, and this is based on a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. It sets the tone for how we view the one who created us. Because the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Allah is as you perceive him to be. Allah is as you perceive him to be. SubhanAllah. This is such a powerful hadith that we don't see mentioned a lot. Because it goes deep into the power of thought, into the power of mental perception. That Allah is as you perceive Him to be. It doesn't mean we make Allah as we want Him to be. No, it means the way you perceive Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the way you are going to frame the relationship that you have with Him. 
You're going to frame that relationship based upon the way you view Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For instance, if you only view Allah as angry, right? As angry, yarhamukullah, as vengeful, as wrathful, as that he is going to throw me into hell, then you will have a relationship with Allah that will be at a distance. You will distance yourself. Who wants to be close to someone who wants to throw them into hell? If you think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just wants to throw all of us into hell, why would you want to have a nearness relationship with someone like that? It will cause, whether you are, 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 are cognizant of it or not, it will cause a distance in the relationship between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I've seen it again and again and again. Many Muslims who come to me in counseling, they don't pray. Why? Not because they don't think they should, because they don't think they are worthy. If you know how many Muslims out there are not praying, be not because they don't want to, but because they feel ashamed. They feel like they've done so much wrong. They feel like they've been astray for so long. They feel like they've done so many bad things that they don't deserve to stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the perception they've created about Allah jalla wa ala. This is a trick of shaitan. A trick of shaitan to despair of the mercy of Allah and is actually one of the, 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 the major sins to despair of the mercy of Allah. This is them, they are having a relationship with Allah as they perceive Him, that He won't accept me back. I've done too much and I have to bring them back to understanding that no matter what you've done, no matter what you've done, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's door to mercy is always open, is always open. As long as your soul has not reached your throat, as long as the sun has not risen from the west, then the door to the mercy of Allah is open to you. Who has told you that Allah cannot forgive you? I could go, if we had time, I'd go on and on and on about the stories of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which I've talked about on my YouTube channel, where uh, the man who killed a hundred people, we say 99, but he ended up killing a hundred. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shrunk the earth, shrunk the parameters of the earth to forgive that man. To forgive that man. Allah could have, how many of you know this story? Raise your hand. Allah could have just made him die closer to the town, right? Simply, easily. But Allah wanted to show you and me how forgiving He is. That even for this man, He was willing to shrink the parameters of the earth between him and that town in order for him to be forgiven. So if Allah is willing to go that far for that man, what about you and me? What about, we, what about you and me? I don't think any of us in this room have killed 100 people. If so, please don't tell us. It is the perceptive relationship that we have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that sets the framework. But if you view Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as merciful, as forgiving, as forbearing, as uh, al ghafur al-Rahman, al-Rahim, al-Wadur, al-Latif, if you see him as that, then you will hope in his mercy. But if you also know him as Shadid al-Iqab, who is severe punishment, and you stay between these two, you know that Allah will punish me, but he wants to forgive me. He will punish me. Without a doubt, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that His punishment is severe and His punishment is for those who are heedless, who are arrogant, who are disbelieving, who are uh, oppressive, etc., so on and so forth. So we want to stay away from those things. But as long as I always know that I can lean upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as forgiving, as merciful. And how do I know that? Because when I opened the Qur'an for the first time in 1998, every single chapter of that book except for one chapter started with in the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. Every single chapter. So for some reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to be really, really, really clear to the world that He is Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Really clear. If we perceive Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at someone, excuse me, ourselves as someone who is worthy of his forgiveness, who is worthy of his mercy, who is worthy of his bounty, then we will behave in that manner and it will change the self-talk that we have towards ourselves. It will change the self-talk. You will start to feel as if you are worthy, you are competent, you are capable, you do deserve the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even though you've done all these other things. But haven't we all? Is there a single one of us here free of sin? Is there a single creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the time of Adam that's free of sin? The Prophet والسلام, said, Quli bani Adam khata. Every son of Adam sins. He said, Every, every, kullu, every son of Adam sins. Al khayru khata'ina tawabun. But the best of those who sin 
are those who return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that perspective on how you view Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is extremely important. Also, the perspective of the relationship you have with Allah. This is a, 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 just a, 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 a tip in this so I can get through the other two before Salat al-Isha, insha'Allah. The relationship that you have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will form the strength of the relationship of your heart and your soul and your body. One of my dearest teachers, one of my dearest friends and teachers, Sheikh Haytham al-Hadad, he is one of the great uh, uh, scholars of Europe, uh, the, the head of the Islamic Council of Europe, the head of uh, 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 the MRDF, which is a Muslim Research and Development uh, Foundation in, in London. I speak to him all the time. I was just in London for 12 days with him before uh, coming here, or before going to Lebanon and coming here. And we got splashed together in some article in the, in the British newspaper. <laughs> but that's a whole nother story. Um, he told me, we spent five days together living in the same apartment in Norway uh, for a conference. And he would hate me for praising him. That's why I do it in his absence. Most of us talk in our sleep, right? All of us at some point, we talk in our sleep. We mumble, we mutter, we do things. Wallahi, I've heard this man on a number of occasions. And I've spent time with him overnight many times. This man recites Qur'an in his sleep. Recites Qur'an in his sleep, literally. I, I would think that he was in his room reciting Qur'an and I would open, knock on the door and, and open the door a little bit and realize he's asleep. He's reciting the Qur'an. He told me, Yusha, your relationship with Allah is based on your relationship with the Qur'an. Your relationship with Allah is based upon your relationship with the Qur'an. If you find your relationship with the Qur'an to be strong, you will find that your relationship to Allah will be strong. If you find that relationship to be weak, you will find that to be weak. He said, why? Because we do not know anything about Allah except that which He has revealed about Himself. We know nothing about Allah except that which He's revealed about Himself. And the only thing He said existing on this planet today that we can say He has revealed about Himself without a shadow of a doubt that no Muslim on the planet will question is Al-Qur'an. This is Kalamullah. This is the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you open it up, He said, you are hearing from the Creator of the heavens and the earth, speaking directly to you. Therefore, make that relationship strong. And you will find that your heart will be strong, your soul will be strong, and the perception that you have about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be correct. Because it will be balanced, because the Qur'an is balanced. The Qur'an is a mizan, it is a balance. He said, you will know right or wrong in your life because the Qur'an is a furqan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the beginning of Surah Al-Furqan, Glory be to him who has revealed this furqan ala abdihi liyakuna lil alameena nadira. He has revealed this furqan to his slaves so that it can come to mankind a warning. He said, you will know about Jannah, you will know about Jahannam, you will know how to live your life. He said, so stay with the Qur'an and the Qur'an will stay with you. He said, there will be many things that will witness for you on the Day of Judgment. And there will be many things that will witness against you on the Day of Judgment. There's another beautiful thing that I love about traveling the world, right? I try to make sure I pray every place I go in the world. Because I know for sure on the Day of Judgment, all of those places have to give testimony to, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about me. That He worshipped you here. Here, 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 all, and all of these things. He said, but the strongest witness, the most just witness on the Day of Judgment will be the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That will be the strongest and most just witness for you or against you. So ask yourself, he said, ask yourself every day, is that Qur'an on my shelf a witness for me or against me? Subhanallah. Trust me, these things change how you think and how you view your life and how you view the world and how you view Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two, tawakkul is the Muslim cannot have spiritual wellness without tawakkul. What is tawakkul? We usually translate tawakkul as trust, but it's not just trust. Like I trust this chair when I sat down on it, right? Why? Because, you know, time, time has told me that chairs, you know, hold you most of the time. I don't, I don't, I saw the brother set it down. It looks like it's sturdy. I sat in it. I didn't think it was going to fall apart, right? We have trust in things based on our life experiences. Tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trusting in Allah 
without reason. When there's no, there's no reason to. Trusting in Allah when there is no why. When there is no why. Why? Because everything Allah has ever done, for, told us, and that we can verify is true. Every promise that Allah has made, that He made to the Prophet Sallallahu is true. We've never ever seen a promise from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to be broken, right? Allah says, Inna Allah la yukhliful mi'ad, He doesn't break His promises. So, and He gives us reason and logic and everything He's given us a reason for or a logic for has come to be known. And through time, we have actually come to find out more and more about the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It has actually opened itself up more and more, right? Through science, through all of these things. And as time goes on, more and more. Therefore, we accept everything from Him even when He doesn't give us a reason. Even when He doesn't give us a reason. When He tells us to trust Him, we do it without, without, without question. Without question. We don't need to know the why. This is the big thing that kills a lot of Muslims is that when Allah puts them in difficulty, they have to know the why. And I'm like, why do you need to know the why? What difference does it matter? Or a Muslim will come to me and say, is Allah punishing me or is He testing me? And I tell them it doesn't matter. It does, that is a question you don't need to answer. Because regardless of whether He's punishing you or testing you, your response is exactly the same. To have patience, to have trust, to be grateful. Regardless, because if he's testing you, he's testing you to increase you. If he's punishing you, he's punishing you to relieve you of sin, which is going to increase you on the day when you meet him. Because he's not going to punish you here and then punish you again in the day of judgment. So either way, it's the same. Either way, it's the same. And we all don't need to know why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does what he does. Because if he told us half the time, we would think it is absolutely crazy. If Allah told us the plan, we would think that this is outrageous, this is outlandish, there's no way. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came to sent Angel Jibreel to Musa's mother, who was after him? Who was looking to kill him? Fir'aun. What did the angel tell Musa's mother? Put him in a box and put him in the river. Was any of the other plan revealed? Did Allah tell her anything beyond that? Nope. He didn't tell her any of the rest of the plan. If he had told her, do you know, do you think she, she might not have went along with it. If he told her, I'm going to send him to Pharaoh's house, she might have said, wait a minute, hold on a second. Wait a minute, that's the very person I'm trying to save him from. That doesn't sound very logical, does it? No, he, she didn't need to know the plan, but she trusted Allah. This is tawakkul, to put your baby in a box and put it in the river, not knowing what is the next part of the plan. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said it, so we do it. And then what happened? Where did it go? It went to Pharaoh's backyard. Could you imagine? Because Moses, I mean, uh, uh, Moses' mother sent his uh, sister, right? To go see where the box goes. Could you imagine if they had modern technology and she would have texted her mom and sent her a picture? Yeah, Snapchat, whatever. Look, the box went to Pharaoh's backyard. She might have said, whoa, 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 get him and bring him home. We didn't, I didn't agree to that. This wasn't part of the plan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't need to tell you the whole plan. You don't need to know because sometimes he works in ways that your little mind just can't fathom. Just can't fathom. He sent him to the very man's house who was out to kill him. And it ended up being his own destruction. Subhanallah. We see this in the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told his prophet to make hijrah, he didn't tell him the entirety of the plan. He, he knew bits and pieces of it. He knew Islam would be successful. But he just told him to go. And he knew it was time to go. I go. Bismillah. I walk out of my house. I don't know how I'm going to get there. It's surrounded. Just go. When, uh, when, when he was standing in the cave with Abu Bakr and they were hiding from the Meccans. Has any of you ever been to that cave, by the way? In Thawr? Anybody? Any, I've been to it. You can't hide in that cave. It's not a hiding place. <laughs> Literally, there's an opening at the bottom where you could see people's feet. Abu Bakr said, Ya Rasulullah, if they look at our feet, they're going to see us. What did the Prophet Sallallahu say? He said, oh, Ya Abu Bakr, what do you think is going to be the outcome of two people whom the third of them is Allah? Tawakkul. He said, at that moment, Sakina came upon me. Who did he leave in his bed that night? Ali, Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu wa slept in his bed covered in his own mantle, knowing that there was assassins who could pop in at any moment and tear him to bits. What, did anybody know what he said about that night? He said, I had the most restful sleep of my life. I had, the Allah gave me sleep like I had never had any other time in my life on that night. This is tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you trust in Allah, He places 
peace. Qalbun sareen. He paces the heart at rest. The heart becomes content with whatever happens after that. Because whatever Allah has planned for you is all good. It's all good. I'll tell you a really quick. I could go on and on about these. I had many stories. I have a lecture about this on YouTube called uh, Trust in the Plan of Allah. Even if you don't understand it. Me and my daughter were doing a uh, jigsaw puzzle during the pandemic. And this was a especially rough time for me mentally because my whole way of life disappeared overnight. Uh, I used to travel and I used to do business. I'm, I'm a car guy, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a gearhead, by the way. I build race cars and I helped other people build race cars. These are hobbies that I've kept to the side because the Muslim community don't let you have nothing in peace. But anyway, I used to get uh, car parts, turbos, superchargers, carbon fiber out of Shenzhou, China and help people build cars. That was a business and I used to take a fee for helping them do these things. It's what we're not. Guess what? March 14th, 2020, that all came to an end in an instant. I had nothing to do with my life. For six months, I didn't know, I'd lost my way. I did not know what I was going to do. And one day, and, and alhamdulillah, my wife brought me out of it. She found me one day and said, this is not the man I married. You need to remember who you are. You need to remember who you are. Sometimes you have to remember to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a good woman if he puts you in your life. The Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said, out of the, the, the goodness of this life, the best of it is a righteous wife, is a good wife. Wife that if you're given a good wife, you're given better than anything anybody has, any king, any 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 anybody. Alhamdulillah. But I was doing a jigsaw puzzle with my daughter, and you know when you do a jigsaw puzzle, there are some pieces that initially make sense, right? The corners, the edges, flowers. There's a house here. Then there'll be like some pieces that are like solid colors. You don't know where they go, right? So I, I told my daughter, I was like, let's just throw these. I was joking. I was like, let's just throw these away. We don't have a place for them. She's like, no, no, you don't throw those away. We'll find a place for them later on. And something, that self-talk in my head said, this is your life. This is your life. These puzzle pieces, because I couldn't figure out why I was tortured as a child. What, I was a kid. Why would I be tortured? My stepmother, Lily, Guantanamo Bay style tortured me for 10 years of my life. Why? I accepted Islam. You get sentenced to seven years in prison. Why did all of these things happen to me? Then I... I, I thought that these are the puzzle pieces of your life that haven't found their place yet. They haven't found their place yet. Why? Because enough of your life hasn't happened. Then I started doing counseling and things of that nature and started opening up about my life and people started pouring in with their problems and, 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 and coming to me with the deepest, darkest secrets that they don't want to share with anybody else to bring them out of the darkness. So I, I was a person who found his way out of the darkness and then went back in with a flashlight to save other people. This was the puzzle pieces of my life that I didn't know why. This is your life, brothers and sisters. If there are parts of your life that you're going through difficulty right now and you don't know where those pieces belong, don't think they don't have a place. Just know that enough of the puzzle hasn't been built yet of your life for that, place, that piece to find its place. Just set it to the side, leave it with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and know that when it is time, you'll find a missing part of your life where that puzzle piece needs to go. Because had I not been through the things I've been through, I don't know if I would have survived the things I went through in as adult. When I was sentenced to, to, to seven years in prison, this was two months after becoming a Muslim, they put me in an eight by 10 cell. And my roommate was like, you're gonna have to get used to this box. And I'm thinking to myself, my stepmother used to lock me in a room half of this size for the first, for, from the age of five until about the age of 15. I spent a lot of time locked in a room smaller than this. This is easy. You see what I'm saying? The, the, had I not gone through that, maybe it would have broke me. Maybe it would have messed with me. But I was like, bro, this is spacious compared to what I grew up in. So there are things in your life Allah is putting you through because He knows there are times you're going to need them. There are times you're going to need them. You don't need to know the plan. You just need to trust the planner. Makaru wa makarullah. We plan and our plans are human. That means they're always going to have flaws. But when Allah plans, Allah is the best of those who plan. So trust His plan, even if it doesn't make sense. Number three, and then so we can uh, pray Isha insha'Allah ta'ala. And this one is super important. Shukr, gratitude. Spiritual wellness cannot live without gratitude. Your heart cannot survive without gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what do I mean by gratitude? I mean gratitude, kulli shay, for everything. For everything, gratitude for every single thing in your life. The good, and even more so the bad. 
because it's easy to be grateful for the good, right? That is just easy. It's easy to be grateful to Allah when things are going good. The test is, can you thank Him when things are not going your way? Can you thank Him when He puts you in the difficulty? Can you thank Him when He puts you in the trials and tribulations? Can you thank Him when He takes things away from you? Can you thank Him when, when, when difficulties surround you? This is the real test. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cemented it in His Qur'an. When, when He came down, when Musa came down, from the mountain and saw Bani Israel, they were doing, you know, I can not even envision the scene that Musa saw when he came down from, from getting the Torah, the things that they were doing, worshiping the cat, who knows what nonsense they were doing. One of the first things Allah told him was to tell them, remind them of the bondage that I brought them out of. Remind them of all the years they begged me to free them from Fir'aun. And I did so. And then tell them, لَإِن شَكَرْتُمْ that if they are grateful to me, I will increase them. But if they are ungrateful, then know that my punishment is severe. So if you want more out of your life, if you want more, the key to success, the key to increase, I don't care about if it's increase in your personal life, meaning your relationship with Allah, if it's increase in your business, if it's increase in your salary, if it's increase in the position that you want to have in, in the community, then be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for where you are now and He will give you more. It is a promise. It is a promise. لَإِن شَكَرْتُمْ لَيْزِدَنَّكُمْ And Allah does not break His promises. So be grateful. When Allah puts you into difficulty, thank Him for that difficulty. And rather than asking the question, why me? Because this is a lot of times exactly what we ask. I've done it. I've been guilty of it many times. When Allah puts us into difficulty, we say, why me? What you should ask yourself is, why not me? Why not me? Our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the best of Allah's creation. Yes or no? Think about that for one second as we wrap it up. He's the best of His creation. What has Allah created? Look at the things which we can see that He created. Look at the world, look at the universe. I am an armchair astrophysicist, by the way, because I love space. I love, I love the infinite of what Allah has created. The more we learn about the beauty of this creation, the more we see the beauty of the Creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But look at the amazing things which He has created. The best of those is our Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he was put through intense difficulty, intense tests. His own family turned on him. His own tribe turned on him. His own city banished him. His own city outcast him. They fought wars against him. Do you know how much that pained him? His own uncle who stood next to him and defended him died without accepting it. Do you know how much all of this pained him? He lost every one of his sons in infancy. Khadijah died at a hard time in his life. The people of Ta'if turned on him after Abu Talib died. The worst day of his life was the day of Ad Ta'if. Our Prophet Sallallahu suffered like no other messenger who came before him. But he still never passed anyone without a smile. He still never uh, did not get up in the middle of night and pray until his feet were cracked and bleeding until Aisha radiallahu anha radaha asked him, why do you do this to yourself? You are the best of Allah's creation. Allah has confirmed on you that you are indeed ala khulqin azim upon the best character. He said, then should I not be grateful? Should I not be grateful to Allah? Gratitude comes when Allah puts you in the difficulty. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes a child, from us, yeah? This is one of the Allah tells the angels, go and build for my slave in paradise a palace for them and name it Baytul Hamd for them because they, I have taken from them that which was so precious to them and they thanked me and praised me for it. This is a key to your spiritual wellness, is being grateful to Allah when He puts you in the difficulty. Thanking Him that you decided to test me because the Prophet ﷺ said, as I finish, this is my last statement to you from our Prophet ﷺ, that if Allah loves you, the Prophet ﷺ said, if Allah loves someone, then He'll put them in the difficulty.
If Allah loves someone, He will test them. Why? Because He knows that test will bring that slave closer to Him. And Allah doesn't love anything more from you than your nearness to Him, you calling upon Him, you beseeching Him in the middle of the night, you begging Him, you going to Him and knowing that no one else can help me but you, O oh Allah. No one else can save me but you, O oh Allah. And that is what I say now for our brothers and sisters who are suffering in Gaza. They are under blockade. They, there is no way we, we can get aid to them. I work with aid organizations. There is nothing we could do right now. You could give me $100,000 tonight and I would tell you I, we can't get it to them. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is capable of all things. Allah says He is ala kulli shay'in qadir. He is upon all things powerful and nothing escapes Him. No one escapes Him. No evil escapes Him. No oppressor will escape Him. No wrongdoer will escape Him. They might think that they have some leeway because the powers of the world stand behind them today. But on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah will roll up the heavens and the earth like a piece of paper and he will say to the kings and the tyrants of the world where is your kingdom now where is your power now today power is for me I am al qawi and you are nothing so never forget that brothers and sisters I know it hurts us I know it pains us but on the day of judgment the mizan will be brought out and not a single soul will be dealt with unjustly. Remember the last verse of the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided to reveal a few days before the death of the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam. وَاتَّقُوا يَوْمٍ تُرْجَعُونَ فِيهِ اللَّهِ And fear a day on which you will be returned to Allah. And on that day no soul will be dealt with but with justice. No one escapes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So brothers and sisters, I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives our brothers and sisters Gaza some, some, some peace amongst all of this strength, all of this, this, this terror that they're going through. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us some peace, give us a qalb bin salim, give us a clean and pure heart and make us of those near to him, inshaAllah. Jazakallah khairan, barakallahu feekum jami'an. I look forward to being with you guys again, inshaAllah.